Podcasting from Singapore and broadcasting all around the world. You're listening to the EdTech Chat Podcast, taking the pulse of educators from all over the globe and bringing what you need every week. Now, over to your host, Craig Kemp. Hello and welcome to episode three of the EdTech Chat Podcast. I'm your host, Craig Kemp, and I'm thrilled to have your support. This podcast episode is sponsored by Makers Empire. Makers Empire helps schools maximize the learning potential of 3D technology, cover design and technologies curriculum concepts, and teach design thinking, STEM concepts, and 21st century learning skills. Within Makers Empire, teachers are supported by comprehensive resources, easy to use software, and class management tools, professional development, and ongoing support provided by Makers Empire customer service team. Thousands of teachers all over the world are using Makers Empire to support their children in accessing the curriculum in an authentic and engaging way. In March 2020, Makers Empire received certification from the Educational Alliance of Finland for pedagogical quality. I have used Makers Empire for many years and have seen it used successfully in schools across many different age levels. What I love about it is just how simple it is to start designing in 3D in minutes. No CAD experience is necessary. Makers Empire 3D works on all devices and can be used by students as young as four years of age. Get connected at makersempire.com. Links are in the description below. As a bonus, listen along at the end of today's podcast when a class subscription to Makers Empire worth $300. I am in awe of your support and I can't thank the hundreds of you enough who came back for episode 2 and you're here again for episode 3. You've followed, listened, subscribed and shared and I'm inspired to continue to provide you with a unique and free high class learning experience. As you know I continue to work with the incredibly talented Mark Quinn to improve the final audio quality of this podcast. Mark is an incredibly talented educator and producer and is a long time connection of mine online. He has his own podcast production suite that provides editing and mastering services to content creators. I highly recommend his services. To connect with Mark, please see the details in the podcast notes below. Each week, I like to pose a question to you to think about throughout the episode and beyond. This week, I'm inspired by the COVID-19 situation. I look at the amazing work happening in my home country of New Zealand and the inspirational leadership by Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern that has led to the successful reopening of the country just this week. As an educator, a leader, or even as a parent, when you're put in an uncomfortable and difficult situation, how do you survive and thrive? What are the steps that you take to be successful? Please share with me via social media. I look forward to learning with you. After more than 300 downloads of this week's episode, I had several questions sent my way, both publicly and via direct messages. Please continue to send them in. This week, I wanted to discuss one question from Mark in the UK. He asked... There are no plans to move back to -to face-to-face teaching here in England in the near future. What is your best advice to continue engaging both parents and students in learning in a K-12 setting? Thank you for your question, Mark. I really love hearing from my professional learning network and sharing my passion for the authentic and purposeful integration of technology for learning. As some schools around the world start to get back into face-to-face learning again, most of us are still in a remote learning situation and will be for some time to come. Weeks tick by and time seems to be going past extremely quickly. For some of us, online learning is getting easier and for others, it's becoming tedious and repetitive. Today, I'm not going to talk about equity of devices or access to Wi-Fi or learning materials. Instead, I'm choosing to focus on the positive. So in this unique and challenging situation, how do you survive and thrive? My first train of thought when posed this question was to think about my family my six-year-old daughter and her experience of remote learning here in Singapore and in particular her school's approach to engaging students in learning for an extended period of time. To me it's all about the teachers. The work I know that they are doing to keep learning going is incredibly hard and exhausting but I'm forever grateful. I wanted to spend a couple of minutes to give a shout out to my daughter's teacher Leanne Thurlow who I know listens to this podcast. Leanne is a great example of a teacher committed to the cause who's going above and beyond to ensure the learning experience is out of this world. In short, my daughter is engaged in a mixture of online and offline activities every day and gets the opportunity to connect with her teachers and friends in a live video call every morning. 
The learning experience for her and her classmates has been extremely positive thanks to the guidance and leadership of Leanne, and I can't thank her enough. In the bigger picture, I want you to think about the Leannes in your school. Who are the people going above and beyond? Can you feed off their energy and excitement? When I think about thriving during these times, I think about co-creation. I think about feeding off each other's energy and working together to create resources and experiences that we wouldn't normally have the opportunity to do. By far, the best experiences I have seen my daughter complete are hands-on project-based learning experience. She is engaged and is able to share her learning in multiple ways. Seesaw has been the platform of choice for her school and it's been very easy for me as a parent to engage and follow the learning process. As you can tell, I get a little passionate when it comes to the things I see and experience firsthand, and I wanted to give a little advice and a few suggestions to help answer Mark's question. Firstly, ask your students and your parents what's working for you, what's not working for you. Use this to help inform your decision making process. Secondly, let them know that they're not alone. We're all struggling through this, and we're doing our very best. If they need help, ask. Most importantly, as a teacher, Stick to what you know, but try something new every week. Push yourself, annual boundaries, test out a new tool or experience. If you haven't used a tool like Flipgrid yet, jump on board and take it for a test drive. Think of innovative ways that your students can use the tool to shake up the learning experience in your classroom. Small, new snippets of learning can help you get out of the funk and into a new inspirational frame of mind. On that note, here are my EdTech tools of the week, and this week, the focus is on new tools to add life to your remote learning classes. I'm going to share with you a few tools to liven up your online learning classes. My suggestion is to pick one, and in the next 24 hours, jump on and play and explore with this tool, and integrate it authentically into a learning experience for your students in the coming week. Please update me with what you did and how it went. Tool number one, Maker's Empire. Go to makersempire.com and connect to a free account. Find out how 3D design can be an engaging way for learners as young as four to make, create, and design, and to show their working and learning in a unique way. You won't be disappointed. Tool number two, Flipgrid. Go to flipgrid.com and sign up to a free account. Flipgrid is free for all educators, learners, and families, and provides a unique way to engage and empower every voice in your classroom or at home by recording and sharing short, awesome videos together. Give it a go. I dare you. Tool number three, Edpuzzle. Go to edpuzzle.com and sign up to a free account. With Edpuzzle, you can make any video your lesson. Use video content the way your students do, by taking clips from YouTube, Khan Academy, and many other platforms, and editing them to suit your lesson and your learners. You can add questions that need to be responded to before the video continues, or even voice over the entire clip to engage your learners. Jump on and try it out. Tool number four, the last one for today, quizzes. An alternative to Kahoot, and an engaging free way to use formative assessment to support your learners in all areas and for all ages. Quiz is, is a way to engage your learners on any device, in person or remotely. Quizzes allows many modes, including flashcards, matching games and much more. It's also fantastic for language learning and teaching new concepts as you can add voice to support. Try it out for free today and try integrating it into your next lesson. There you go. Four new EdTech tools for you to have a go at. Remember, know your why and pick just one to start with. This podcast is designed to inform but also educate the general education community and each week I like to give some advice and tips for educators in relation to the authentic and purposeful use of technology in your schools. This week, I want to briefly continue the conversation from last week when we talked about the power of an EdTech strategy and where it fits within the school and who owns it. An EdTech or ICT strategy is often overlooked in many schools, especially where schools do not have dedicated staff to oversee this area. However, this important document can be the difference between a sustainable approach and a failed approach to using technology. 
An effective ICT strategy always starts with the why. As I shared last week, I'm a believer in people always knowing their why and being able to give an elevator pitch to demonstrate their understanding. EdTech strategy development should always be the first thing schools look at when making a plan. If you want to have a sustainable approach that is not reliant on one person in your building, then a plan is where to start. Where do you start, you ask? Well, the first thing I always do with schools is to get them to do the activity I shared with you last week. Prepare a 30 second elevator pitch that justifies your vision for technology integration at your school. It's a great fun activity and a great way for people to share their ideas. These can then be combined and collated to help develop an initial draft of a vision statement for technology that reflects the school's larger mission and vision for education. After that, I get the leadership team to think about their people and develop the key stakeholders that need to be part of a steering committee for technology learning. This committee can then be formed and can start to develop initial stages of strategy discussions. The committee almost always will include a member of the school leadership team, a member of teaching faculty in each core area of the school, and often it also includes students and parent representatives that can be called upon when needed. Remember, this is just a starting point but it does require a lot of action and time. We'll continue to look at strategy for this sort of implementation over the coming weeks. Every week, I bring you a short interview with some of my edu heroes, an engaging learning experience with someone who makes a difference in education every day with a particular focus or angle towards educational technology. Let's have a listen. Today, I have the honor of speaking with Eric Scheninger. You might know him as at E underscore Scheninger on Twitter, with a whopping 152,000 followers. And yes, he is Blue Tick official. Eric and I have been connected for many years, and he's long been my go-to resource. Eric is an award-winning principal, author, and keynote speaker from the US. His best-selling books, keynotes, and workshops inspire people daily from all over the globe. And now as an associate partner with the International Center for Leadership and Education, he is set to inspire the next generation of school leaders. Eric, it's an incredible pleasure to have you on the show today. Are you ready to talk education and technology integration? Oh, I'm ready to talk, but I'm just beaming over that very nice introduction, Craig. Great to be here. Absolute pleasure, mate. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your current role and what inspires you to do what you do? Yeah, so uh, currently I'm an associate partner with the International Center for leadership and education here in the United States. And, you know, our work is really about how we can fundamentally change, transform teaching, learning, and leadership at scale. So, you know, we, my areas of focus are everything from leadership to pedagogy, instructional design, equity, social emotional learning, you know, the whole gamut. And, you know, we really pride ourselves in looking at research based practices, what actually works, and partnering with schools, districts, and organizations on job embedded, ongoing work that actually leads to qualitative and quantitative evidence of improved student outcomes. Totally inspiring. I can't believe that you get to do that each and every day and inspire so many other people as well. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's been an interesting journey for me, you know, as a, a former teacher and principal who adamantly against all the changes that I now champion, kind of after having my aha moments uh, back in the day, you know, a, a lot of my motivation and inspiration for what I do now came from the work of my teachers, students, parents, and other administrators at my high school uh, in the state of New Jersey, where, you know, we did a lot of things that people talk about now, but we did it 10 years ago. Personalized learning, blended learning, maker spaces, bring your own device. The, the difference was that we didn't just do it. We were able to show how those initiatives uh, aligned with uh, everything that we were doing to improve teaching and learning actually led to increases in achievement and sustained changes to instructional practices. So, you know, we, we are, we're the sum of all our experiences, Greg. And, you know, I can say that making that uh, 180 shift in my own thinking and then playing a, a small role in not telling my staff what to do but instead taking them where they needed to be 
uh, that, you know, in the end, you know, we were able to, you know, create a pretty impressive case study uh, in terms of what could happen in education. And that kind of became the springboard for my transition to uh, the International Center for Leadership and Education. And I guess in your role now at a big umbrella level, you get to see a lot of what um, changes are being made in education today, not just uh, in the US, but globally. What excites you about education today? Well, you know, there's a lot that excites me, but but I kind of want to go back to kind of what I see. And, and, you know, honestly, you know, sometimes we are blinded by our own bias, you know, or we are sort of held victim by the most dangerous phrase in education. That's the way we've always done it. And often we keep doing what we've always done because of high test scores. So, you know, in 2019, uh, I visited and worked in over a thousand different classrooms uh, here in the United States. So I was able to get a very good perspective. And here's what I saw. You know, uh, more often than not, uh, we, uh, I observed traditional practices. Not saying that's bad per se, but, you know, you know, we, schools for the most part, are educating kids for a world that no longer exists. And my job is to help motivate, inspire, persuade, compel, whatever word we want to use, to have teachers and administrators take a critical lens to their work and ask the question, is this best serving our learners, not just for their future, but for now? Now, being that, you know, it's not doom and gloom, that's just being honest. And I think if we really want to fundamentally improve education, we have to be honest about where we are. Because if that, that happens, then we can actually begin to move to where we want to be or our kids need us to be. Now, in terms of awesome practices, I see a lot of that as well. And, you know, what I'm seeing more so is a, a real move to uh, personalized learning. And when we think about personalization, you know, it, it doesn't have to have anything to do with technology. Personalized learning is not about putting every kid in front of a device on an adaptive learning tool and letting them have at it, where there's no discourse, no conversation. When I talk about personalized learning, it's about bringing in those elements of student agency, voice and choice, and then looking at how blended learning can really take it to the next level, path, pace, and place. So what I'm seeing in more and more schools is at least one of those five elements, voice, choice, path, pace, and place both with and without technology. We are also starting to see the more purposeful use of technology to not just have kids recall and tell us what they know, but actually show that they understand. And as we're starting to see, and the shift is slow, Craig, but it is starting where we're starting to see kids in schools using technology to learn in ways that they couldn't without it. And the one thing that I always challenge teachers and administrators uh, with when it comes to technology is how will your kids use technology to learn in ways that they couldn't without it? And secondly, how does it represent a fundamental improvement over what we've done in the past? Thirdly, uh, I think one of the biggest shifts that I'm seeing that's been embraced uh, at scale is the move to more flexible learning spaces, which really cater to uh, the elements of personalized learning that I mentioned before. But we're seeing a lot more flexible seating, use of outdoor spaces, uh, getting kids out of sedentary desks, and and really transform this space based on research. You know, research has shown that classroom design can impact learning by as much as 25%, positive or negative. Everything from furniture, layout, temperature, color, acoustics, and lighting. So those are the three main things that I'm seeing. But again, we have lots of isolated pockets of practice. Uh, All schools are doing amazing things, Craig, but what we have to really think about doing is how we begin to scale those practices. I think scalability is such a huge point. I do a lot of work here in Southeast Asia with schools and particularly now with some edtech startup companies as well. And one of the things we talk about is scalability and, and, and scale. 
on both levels, the scalability of a product and a tool to be um, a best fit for schools and not just coming in as a sales pitch and going, here's a tool that you need, but actually asking schools what's a problem that we can solve. And from the school's perspective as well, understanding and knowing what the problem is that they can solve and then how can that be scaled across the whole school to really support and add value to student learning, just like you've pointed out. And I think for you as a as someone on the, the biggest of stages as well, you must get asked all the time for your best advice. And I know that there's people listening now that um, are sitting there going, but what about me? I'm just a classroom teacher. I'm a classroom teacher in the classroom. And I hate that phrase, I'm just a classroom teacher because you're so much more than that. But what about that classroom teacher that's listening right now? What's your best piece of advice for them about embracing educational technology? So I, I think the best advice is uh, multifaceted. First, don't prepare kids for something. Prepare kids for anything. And that simple phrase can help us really think about you know, our instructional design, is how are we empowering kids to think and how are we empower, empowering kids to apply their thinking in relevant and meaningful ways. But when I think about advice, and I, I get this question all the time uh, about teachers. And I'm only a teacher, just like what you said. Here's the thing, everybody. Where does real change happen? It does not happen from administrators because they are not the ones in the classrooms doing the work. They are establishing a vision. They are providing support. But who is doing the work? It is the teachers. Leadership is not about position, title, or power. Leadership is about action. And if we want to really fundamentally change teaching, education, it's the action of our teachers. They are the ones on the front lines. They are the ones that are embracing, you know, these transformative changes to pedagogy through the purposeful use of technology. They are the ones that are taking the risks. They are the ones that are constantly reflecting. They are the ones that are taking feedback in order to improve their craft. You know, going back to my short story about, you know, where, uh, you know, I, I'm from, you know, my journey. It, you know, we were successful not because of what I did as a principal. We were successful because the majority of the teachers did not buy in because we weren't selling a better way to do things, they embraced different and better because they saw the value, they embraced change, they took action, and the rest is history. We were able to fundamentally improve all aspects of our system. Well, I love that story. I really do. And I think it's something that a lot of schools and in particular leadership teams can really learn from because I think all too often a lot of the schools that I work with, it's that top-down type approach that at the end of the day, it doesn't work. You're trying to push people in, in places and in ways that they don't want to move in. And I think it's it's when it comes from those classroom teachers that, it, like you said, they're making the difference and doing the, the things that matter every day, that true change happens. Uh, in your schools and in your experience, Eric, tell me a little bit about professional learning networks and, and how you've used professional learning networks to help engage yourself, but also how you've helped others engage in real learning. And what's your professional learning network of choice? Yeah, you know, so, you know, my gateway uh, tool to the world of professional learning networks was Twitter back in 2009. And, uh, you know, I got on Twitter just to communicate, but then I became a creepy lurker and then transitioned to a connected lurker. And uh, Twitter kind of uh, opened my eyes to a world that I did not know that it existed. And as I think about, you know, the role of it was, you know, it wasn't the tool per se that radically changed what I did. It was the access that the tool gave. And I think when we think about professional learning networks, it, it, it's not about the tool, how many tools we use. It, it, it's about what do we glean from uh, that pathway, that connection, you know, resources, ideas, strategies, uh, thinking about, uh, you know, what we're, uh, you know, grappling with, asking questions, answering questions. So as we think about, you know, the role of a personal learning network, it's been invaluable to, to my growth 
uh, as an educator. And, and I can honestly say that many of the changes that uh, we embarked on, I would never have known of. Because I would never have done because I found out about them all on social media. So, you know, when, even though it started with Twitter, you know, I now dabble in them all. I mean, I love Pinterest as a way to curate. Uh, I don't really use social bookmarking tools anymore. I love using Pinterest. Uh, LinkedIn, uh, I have my own niche there because there's a, a, a different, uh, I would say mindset, but you have some people that might not be comfortable on uh, Facebook or Twitter in that space. You know, Instagram, Periscope for live videos. So, I mean, if there's a mainstream social media tool out there, it is a component of my professional learning network. But the, the, my sort of strategy is simple. There's me, and I use social media to connect to the smart people. That is the power of a professional learning network. Yeah, I love that. I love that a lot. Let's go down to the micro level here now. And and I think a lot of the people listening are going, well, that's awesome. I love that idea. What's one thing that I can do right now? What's one tool that can change the way I do things? Maybe help my students engage and connect in a more efficient or effective way? Or how can I help myself be more efficient in my day-to-day -day work? What's an ed tech tool that you currently love using in your day-to-day -day work that you think everyone needs to know about? Yeah, and, I, and I, I try to caution people not to get so focused on the tool, but more the outcome. You know, when we think about growth, we think about improvement. You know, what, what do you want to accomplish? Do, do you want feedback? Uh, do you want support? Uh, do you just want to get knowledge and information? So, you know, for me, you know, there's a lot of tools out there. But one of my favorites, and I'm kind of going to try to categorize them, is Flipboard. Uh, I love Flipboard. It's an app on my phone, and Flipboard allows me to create a customizable uh, news feed based on my interests. So every day, you know, I can go on Flipboard and see all the current events, blog posts, YouTube videos, articles about things that I am truly interested in. You know, when I think about connection, uh, I, I go to Twitter. You know, Twitter is my, my bread and butter. Uh, I love using it. So I have that there. You know, if I want to uh, curate, store, organize all my information, I then go to Pinterest. If I want to do virtual PLCs and coaching and have more, is not isolated, but more grouped conversations, both asynchronously and synchronously, I'll go to Voxer. Voxer is a push to talk app that you can add to your phone. It's great for doing book studies, uh, for having uh, grade level teams, uh, content area teams. Uh, you know, if I want to really get into more detailed, embedded, threaded conversations, uh, I will go in, on to LinkedIn. So really, I, I look at the goal and the outcome and then apply it to a tool that will help me meet it. You know, when I think about learning in the classroom for, for teachers and even for administrators, you know, my favorite tool is Mentimeter. You know, Mentimeter, you learn one tool and you can use it 11 different ways. It's great for polls, word clouds, you know, all this. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, so those, I can go on and on again, but it's always, Craig, about the outcome. I love that. And I think for everyone listening, there's so many great tools there. And yeah, jump on and use them if it works. And I think Simon Sinek says it really well. He says, people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. And I think it's it's why that tool is going to be purposeful and how you're going to use it that makes all the difference. And I, I couldn't agree more with that. As well, you've pointed out a lot that learning is super important and as educators, learning comes so naturally to us. What's one book or resource that you've been reading lately or just one of your all-time favorite resources? Tell us why we should be exploring it. Oh, my goodness. Well, that, that's kind of a, a tricky question because part, part of me wants to just tell you to go to my books. But, you know, I'll try to do it twofold. So, you know, you know I, I, I did just release a new edition of Digital Leadership. And I wrote it from a perspective of no matter if you're a teacher leader, building leader, organizational leader, it will speak to you. I, I really took a lot of the tools out and made, made it more about dispositions, behaviors. So, you know, I, I, have, I mean, that to me, it's been very successful, especially during this pandemic uh, that people have been going to that resource because it really speaks to the types of changes that 
you know, we should have implemented before this. You know, when I think about, um, you know, another great resource, I go back to a book that really just changed my thinking, and that was Drive by Daniel Pink, and, and really is uh, the science of motivation. So, you know, um, as I went through that book, it really got me to think about, you know, are we more focused on extrinsic or intrinsic? Um, another great resource that um, that I have is not a book, but it's a, a site called Ed, Sh- Ed Shelf. E D S H E L F. Ed Shelf is a user generated search engine um, that has all of these different uh, uh, apps and such that uh, you can search by grade level, price, content, and it really helps teachers and administrators. Uh, find the right tool for the right task. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, um, that's definitely one that I'm going to go away and have a look at as well. You, you touched on this a little bit, Eric, but tell us more about your books. Uh, you're not only the guy on the stage that's helping people move and grow and change and, you know, like online sharing all sorts of nuggets of wisdom, but you also are a very talented author and writer. And I think for me, that's another reason why you're a bit of an inspiration in this space. Tell us a little bit about your books and what inspired you to write them and, and why we should read them. Well, what inspired me to, you know, to write the books is, you know, I'm not a writer or a speaker by trade. You know, I was inspired by the work of my teachers. I was inspired by the results that we got. I was inspired by my students. And, and that's when I began to write books. I, I got solicited to write my first book on Twitter. And I never met my authors, co-authors face to face until the book was done. So it was the work, Craig. And this is what I always advise people when they ask me for advice about writing a book is the work is what motivated, inspired me to write the book. When you when you believe in what you're doing and you have the results and you can see how it's actually leading to uh, sustain change, it becomes a lot easier to write. So, you know, I always go back to my first real book and I say that because, you know, a lot of them I was kind of learning as I went and that was digital leadership. And and a lot of that was about how we fundamentally change teaching, learning and leadership at my former high school. Uh, That led to uncommon learning. And by uncommon, it was really bringing a focus to the different pedagogical techniques that um, we need to scale, you know, looking at blended learning, uh, bring your own device. Uh, one-to-one where there's actually fundamental changes to teaching and learning, Uh, flexible seating, space design. Uh, That was followed by Learning Transformed, uh, where we looked at over 100 research studies to develop eight keys that the research has shown is pivotal to initiating, sustaining change in education. And then Brand Ed came out shortly after that. You know, how do we tell our story? How do we, you know, celebrate all the good things that we're doing, build relationships and uh, build a culture that uh, we're all proud of. And then finally, as I just mentioned, a new edition of Digital Leadership came up, uh, came out recently. So if I'm here to try to compel people why books are important, they're chock full of research, evidence and stories, trying to bring all those three elements together to create a valuable resource for any educator. Thank you so much, Eric. Hey, one last question before I let you get on with your day. What what about the leaders that are listening here? I think we've talked a lot about teachers and, and you've touched on leadership and the importance of that as well, particularly around educational technology and inspiring their staff to, to grow and change and develop and, you know, with the ultimate aim of supporting our kids and, and being the best that they can be. What's your best advice for leaders? Don't ask others to do what you're not willing to do or have not done yourself. You need to model. You need to help people believe that this is meaningful work. You know, think about change. That aspect of modeling is so important, but also providing support. As a leader, you don't have to learn every tool. You don't have to know everything. That's the whole awesome aspect of a a professional learning network. You know, you can get answers, you can ask questions, but you need to provide support. You, you need to have a deep understanding of pedagogy and instructional design so you can give your teachers feedback to help them improve. You know, teachers, they're, they're not dumb. If they know the leader's not invested, if they know the leader doesn't know what he or she is looking at, you know, that has a negative impact 
on a desire to change. You know, so when we think about that leadership, that support, listening, also providing really good professional learning opportunities for your teachers. And when you provide those learning opportunities, learn with them. You know, there's nothing more motivating for a teacher than to have an administrator learning side by side with him or her. I mean, we're all in this together, Craig. So, you know, a lot of it is, yes, you want to do a, establish a vision, make it a collaborative vision that's established through consensus, have shared goals, develop on what those outcomes you want to be. But everyone's got to play their role because it's not about teacher and administrator. We're all educators working for the same, working towards the same goal, and that is preparing kids to be successful now and in the future. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Eric. You've given us so many points of inspiration, so many nuggets of wisdom today. You've made my job really hard when I come down to edit this to fit within my podcast now because there's just so much good stuff. Now, what's the best way for the listeners to follow and connect with you? Well, they can go to my website, which is ericsheninger.com, E-R-I-C-S-H-E-N-I-N-G-E-R.com. And I'm also very active on Twitter, uh, E underscore Scheninger. Those are the best ways, but you could do a simple Google search and you will see that I am not a hard person to find. Eric, thank you so much for your time today. Totally inspired as always. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Craig. Next week, join me for episode four of the EdTech Chat podcast, when I'm joined by STEM teacher, keynote speaker, author, and EdChat co-founder, Shelley Sanchez. Every week, I bring you prizes and giveaways as a thank you for tuning in, listening, and hopefully subscribing to the EdTech Chat podcast. Now with a sponsor, I'm able to up these prizes and give you more. Last week, George Kuros inspired us with all of his insights into innovation and gave away audio copies of his latest book, Innovate Inside the Box. Thank you to the many people that entered the competition. The correct answer, of course, was George's best-selling book, The Innovator's Mindset. The three winners have already been contacted directly by me, and they are Raina Lazaro, Karen Melsky, and James Abella. Congratulations to the winners. This week, our sponsor, Maker's Empire, is giving away a full class subscription to their program valued at $300. To win a full class subscription to Maker's Empire, all you need to do is tag both Maker's Empire and myself on Twitter, or your social media of choice, and tell us why you should win a class subscription. The team at Maker's Empire will choose the most inspirational reason to win, so get sharing. The links are in the description below. Competition closes on Wednesday the 27th of May, and the winner will be contacted directly by me and announced on next Friday's podcast episode. Good luck. If you enjoyed today's episode, please smash that subscribe button and share it with your colleagues, friends, and families. I appreciate your support. Please share your favorite part of today's episode by tagging me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. And please don't hesitate to ask me questions that I can answer in an upcoming episode. Remember, you have the chance to win as well. Check out the links in the description for more. See you again next week. Thank you for listening to the EdTech Chat Podcast. Creating a community for educators to learn, share, and grow. If you like today's episode, please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss another episode. And be in the drawing to win prizes every week. If you know others that would enjoy the show, please hit that share button and brighten their day. Join us again next week for your weekly EdTech hit with at Mr. Kemp NZ. We'll see you again soon.